Well, good morning. Uh, as Alan has already said, welcome to New Life Community Church. Uh, we are glad that you're here today. Uh, for those of you who may be visiting, my name is Jasper Jack. I am the executive pastor here. Uh, our lead pastor, Kyle, and his family have been on vacation this week, and they're headed home today. So pray for them uh, for safe travels. Um, for those of you who are not guests who call this place home, I am Jasper. I know I look different. Uh, I didn't even want to address this, but I feel like it's the elephant in the room, like literally. So like, I feel like Mr. Potato Head this morning. So it's coming back. Don't worry. It will be back. So anyway, um, enough of that. Uh, it's an it's a honor and a privilege to, to preach to you guys this morning. I love doing this each week. I love to <clears throat> gather with you guys and sing and worship and praise God. And um, you guys are family, you know, so it's great. It's great to get together and do this. So today we're going to be kicking off a new series that we're going to go through this summer. Um, it is going to be a time of looking at the Psalms. And we've been doing this for the last several years. We've done this a few years in a row now. Um, this summer, we're going to look at 10 different psalms, and eventually, we're going to get through all 150 of them. That might take us about 15 years, so you guys got to keep coming back. <laughs> That's the way we'll do this, but, but we've been slowly working through them each year, and, and it's just a really refreshing thing to do during the summer because there's so much we can glean from the psalms, and so it's a great time of reflection. So this summer, we're going to be doing that. We're kicking that series off today. Now, the theme or the aim or the, even the title of this series is Aligning Ourselves with God's Heart. And the reason we chose that is we bec that's, the, that's the goal of what we're doing all summer in each sermon. Uh, we're going to try to align ourselves with God's heart. But uh, there was a, a really great Puritan uh, preacher and author named Richard Sibbs that said, the Psalms are the anatomy of a holy man, which lay the inside of him outward for all to see. If the Scriptures be compared to a body, then the Psalms would be the heart. They are so full of sweet affections and passions. In other portions of Scripture, God speaks to us. But in the Psalms, holy men speak to God and to their own hearts. And so that last part, that holy men speak to God and their own hearts, that is all about alignment alignment. Um, you will always face a decision each day on who or what you are going to align yourself with. Now, for Christians, the answer to that's pretty clear, right? Uh, we should align ourselves with Christ and with God and what His Word says. But our flesh is rebellious to God and His Word. So we have a decision to make every day, every single day, about alignment. The Psalms are a great gift from God. Um, especially concerning this alignment struggle. So in them, we see mankind dealing openly and honestly with God in a variety of issues. Every one of them points us towards God's heart, showing us the way to align ourselves with that heart. And that is exactly what we're going to do today. So today we're going to look at Psalm 19. If you brought your Bibles or you're on a tablet or phone, go ahead and pull that up. Psalm 19 let me pray for us really quickly before we get started, and then we'll jump in. Father, we love you, and we thank you for the opportunity to be here today. We know it is a great privilege, so we're grateful. God, we pray that as we look at your word, as we read from it, that you would pierce our hearts, that you would convict us, Lord, that you would speak life to us, and that the Holy Spirit would move. I pray for the people in this place, that they would be receptive to your word, that you would speak through me. God, we do it all for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, <clears throat> Psalm 19 is where we're going to be. And I want to start out by telling you guys a little bit uh, to try to kind of tee this up for you. So behind me, you'll see on the screen, there's going to be a picture. Um, this is a picture of me right around 2002, maybe. And I'm in <clears throat> Colorado at Pikes Peak. Anybody ever been to Pikes Peak in Colorado? Yeah, cool. So you can drive up this, this pretty sketchy road at times all the way to the top of Pikes Peak. There's like a visitor center. It's very touristy. But this, was, this trip was the first time I'd ever been to Colorado when it wasn't covered in snow. So this was during the summer. I went with a church trip. On the way down, uh, we're going back down the mountain. We stopped and got out and kind of got off the beaten path a little bit. We're playing on boulders and all of that. And we find this spot that just was great. And so 
I'm, you know, my feet are dangling. Like it's a really sketchy spot. I'm sure they don't, don't want you doing that. But, but I'm sitting there and I'm looking out over all of this in front of me. And all I could think about was, man, God is awesome. Look at this creation. Look at what he made. It's just beautiful. It, it's, it'll take your breath away. And so that moment for me, and this, this picture, a friend took this of me. I didn't even know he was, was doing this, but it captures perfectly that feeling of just awe and wonder when we see God's creation and when we see nature. I know a lot of you have felt this same thing. Um, usually places, and I've got some pictures here, places like um, the Grand Canyon, you know, when you go there, or maybe the Redwood Forest, when you go, oh, that's Niagara Falls, that too but the redwood forest. So that, that scale shows you how big these trees are. So side note on this, Mandy and Shane uh, went, I think this earlier this year or last year to, to both of these places. And I remember Shane telling me uh, when they got back that when they were in the redwood forest, he said, man, it was the weirdest thing. He said, when we got there and we kind of got into the, the forest pretty deep, he said, it, there was no sound, no birds chirping, no crickets, no, no cars, no footsteps, no nothing. It was just silent. And he didn't say this, but I couldn't help but think that that to me sounds like everything there is just kind of in wonder of what God has done. That creation is kind of worshiping. So <clears throat> again, that, that was not Shane's word. Those are just kind of my thoughts. But, but places like this, Niagara Falls, um, is another place that people go, and it's just beautiful. And then, of course, in our, even in our home state of Arkansas, we have the Buffalo River at the north part of the state. It's just gorgeous. Like, Man can't create that. That is just beautiful. And so every time we go to these type places, I know for me, whether it's a place like this or whether it's in my own backyard, I always have that feeling of just kind of wonder and just awe at God's creation, even if it's just for a few minutes and then I get distracted by whatever. There's always a moment where I just, I can't help but acknowledge the creator. And so I think most of us have that. And it could be something as small as a, a butterfly on a flower or something as large as a tornado that you just, I don't know about you, but that always evokes immediate worship. It's like, dear Lord, dear Lord, dear Lord. <laughs> it's immediate. But it's, it's clear even in that that we are so small and he is so big. So creation does this. It has a way of, of putting things into perspective for us when we're presented with it in that way. So you can't look at our world, you cannot look at creation and not see God's fingerprints on all of it. If you look close enough, it is clear that there is a design to it all, which means there's a designer, right? There's a creator. Someone is behind this. We know that to be God. This is just one way that God reveals himself to us. Okay, so he reveals himself to us through creation. This is known as a revelation. That's what the word revelation means. It's when something previously unknown is now made known, especially between God and man. So this is one way God reveals himself. He's revealed himself through creation, through what he made. What's another way that God has revealed himself to us? Anybody want to take a stab at it? Through his word, right? He's made himself known to us through his word. So God reveals himself to us, his glory, his attributes to mankind in two ways. Through his works and through his word. All right? So in his systematic theology book, Lewis Burkhoff, and I know, boring, but Lewis Burkhoff, a great theologian, says this about these two, these two revelations of God. He says, the one, being creation, is addressed generally to all intelligent creatures and is therefore accessible to all men. The other, the word, is addressed to a special class of sinner to whom God would make known his salvation. Creation has in view to meet and supply the natural need of creatures for knowledge of their God. The other, the word, is to rescue broken and deformed sinners from their sin and its consequences. So our big idea today, the theme of this sermon, the point I'm trying to get across to you is this. God's twofold revelation of himself 
should create a hunger and a thirst for righteousness in his people. Okay? So the two ways God makes himself known to us, that twofold revelation should create a desire for holiness and righteousness and to be like God. So join me. Let's read uh, Psalm 19. We're going to start at verse 1. And it says this, The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of His hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Now, depending on what translation you're reading, that's going to read a little different, and I'll get to that in just a second. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their utterances to the end of the world. In them he has placed a tent for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to run his course. Its rising is from one end of the heavens and its circuit to the other end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. In keeping them, there's great reward. So who can discern his errors? Acquit me, or forgive me, of hidden faults. Also, keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, and I shall be acquitted or forgiven of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So there's a lot going on in these verses. Um, the way I want to break this down, we're going to talk through it. If you noticed in verses 1 through 6, this is David. David wrote this psalm. He's talking about God's creation. So verses 7 through 11 are talking about God's word or his law. And then the last half is kind of a response to that. So that's how we're going to look at that today. So let's start out by looking at verses 1 through 6. This is what's known as general revelation. Okay, as I explained earlier, this goes out to all mankind. Creation is what we're talking about here. This is God's works, general revelation. So verse 1, it says, The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of His hands. Now, heavens here, heavens usually in, in Scripture means one of three things. Heavens can mean the sky and the clouds. It can mean the, the atmosphere, the universe, the planets, the stars, all of that. Or it can mean heaven, the place heaven where God resides. So usually it's one of those three ways. A great example, Genesis 1 says that in the beginning, God created the heavens, plural, and the earth, meaning everything. He created it all. It's all his handiwork. But different places in Scripture, you'll see that word heavens used, usually to describe either the sky or the planets, or whatever. So it means a couple different things. Here, what David's talking about is kind of all of that. It's the sky, it's the stars, it's the planets. We can look up and just see God's work on display, right? You guys, I can just tell you right now, and I know you'll have an image in your mind of what a clear, beautiful night away from city lights where you can see the stars looks like. There are too many to count, right? And that is all part of God's creation that he made. So expanse in this verse is just another word for sky. So when we look up, we look at the heavens, we look at the expanse, we see God's hand at work. The sky, the stars, the planets, all of it is telling of the glory of God. The verses 2 through 4, it says, Day to day pours forth speech, night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Their line goes out through all the earth and their utterances to the end of the world. So when I first read this, I was a little confused because it says day to day pours forth speech and their utterances go to the end of the earth. But then there's that verse right in the middle that says they have no words, there's no speech. What's happening here? So 
Essentially what this means, and again, if you're, if you're reading from the ESV or a different translation, rather than saying uh, they have no words or there are no words, it might say that there are no words that are not heard. So what David is saying in this is that every single day and every single night, it attests to the fact that there is a God, there is a creator. And guess what? That message goes to the ends of the earth without ever having to say a word. There's no verbal message going out. We don't wake up to the sunrise every day with this audible sound throughout the sky saying, God's real. That, that doesn't happen. That doesn't have to. We can clearly see with our eyes in creation that God is the creator and that he is glorious. Now, that, another word there that kind of stumped me was it says their line goes out. So I had to look this up. What this means is almost like a property line. So this message, these utterances of day and night, not only goes out, but their property line is to the end of the world. It goes all over the world. It's everywhere for us to see. So moving on, verses 4 through 6, in the second part of verse 4, it says, In them he has placed, talking about the day and the night, in them he has placed a tent for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. It rejoices as a strong man, to run his course. Its rising is from one end of the heavens and its circuit to the other end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. Now again, we're talking about the day and night. We're talking about the sky. We're talking about the sun and the moon and all of this. So the sun every day rises and sets. There's nothing hidden from its heat. And the sun usually brings with it thoughts of joy and happiness. You know, I know there are some people out there that are weird like Alan that love rain and cloudy days, <laughs> but, and I do too, but, but most of the time when we think of joy and happiness, it's sunshine, right? It's sunny days, it's happiness, it's birds chirping. So there's just that natural assumption that the sun brings with it happiness and joy. It, even so much so that this example <laughs> uh, didn't want to talk about, but I'm going to. David uses the example of a bridegroom coming from his chamber. I kind of skimmed over this at first, and I was like, oh, okay, that doesn't make sense. But think about it. What's a bridegroom? A bridegroom is a groom. He's a guy that just got married. When he comes out of his chamber the next morning, that smile on his face, <laughs> you know why. <laughs> so the sun brings that kind of happiness. That's what we think of when we see the sun and the day. This message is clear. God is good. God is glorious. So God's handiwork, God's creation, his works, Attest to the fact that there's a creator. Everywhere we look, we see God's glory smeared across all of creation. It's on every cell of every being. If you've ever looked under a microscope, you see that, that meticulous design that our creator implemented. In Luke chapter 19, verse 40, which is known as that, this account's known as the triumphal entry as Jesus was riding the donkey into Jerusalem, the Pharisees are telling Jesus as the people are shouting, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna, and they're calling him the Messiah. The Pharisees are telling Jesus, you need to rebuke them. They're saying that you're the Messiah, that you're the Savior. You need to get on to them. And he tells them, if they keep silent, the stones will cry out. Creation was made to glorify God. That's what it attests to, even without words. We can see it in nature. But if we don't worship God, they will. The stones and the earth will cry out in worship. Romans 8, 19-23 says that creation eagerly awaits the revealing of the sons and daughters of God in hope that creation will be set free. You see, with the fall and the introduction of sin, not only are, is mankind sinful, but creation is not even as it was meant to be. And it says that creation eagerly awaits the day that it can worship God the way it was created to again. So this alone, this idea that creation attests to the fact that there's a God, that nature speaks of God, this alone should be enough for mankind to believe in God. Romans 1, chapter, chapter 1, verse 20 says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and his divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. 
So God's work, God's creation is all the proof that we should require to know that God exists. But we know this isn't true, right? We know that creation is not enough, right? Not, not everyone believes in God. There, there are theories out there against this. Why? Well, again, uh, the guy Burkhoff that wrote the Systematic Theology has an interesting thought on this. He says, speaking of the Reformers, their view of this matter is represented as follows. As a result of the entrance of sin, so the fall in the garden, as a result of that, the handwriting of God in nature is greatly obscured and is in some way, in some of the most important matters, rather dim and ineligible. Even more so, man is now stricken with spiritual blindness and is deprived of the ability to read properly what God originally plainly wrote in the works of creation. So to remedy this and to prevent this from continuing to happen, God did two things. One... His supernatural revelation, being His Word, in that He republished the truths of natural revelation and cleared them of misconception, interpreted them with a view to present the needs of man, and incorporated them in His supernatural revelation of redemption. And then the second thing God did was in addition to that, He provided a cure for the spiritual blindness of man through the work of regeneration and sanctification, including... Spiritual illumination. Now our eyes are opened to the things of God. And he enabled man once again to obtain true knowledge of God that carries with it the assurance of eternal life. So what Burkhoff is saying in this systematic theology is that creation attested to the fact that there is a God, that God is real. It's everywhere. It's clearly seen. But then the fall happened. Sin gets introduced. And we no longer see it the way we were intended to. Our, our vision is blurred. And even creation itself is under the curse of sin. So what does God do to remedy that problem? He gives us his word. So this is where we get into verses 7 through 11. God now, or David now turns his attention to God's law and his word. Well, let's look at that. Special revelation is God's word. So we have general revelation, which is in creation, and then we have a special revelation through God's word. It is spoken through the prophets of old. It is written once and for all in the 66 books of the Bible that we now have. It is considered inspired, infallible, and inerrant. To it we cling. And to it we hold. Chapter 1, paragraph 1 of the 1689 Confession of Faith says this, The Holy Scripture is the only sufficient certain and infallible rule of all saving knowledge of faith, obedience, although the light of nature and the works of creation and providence do manifest the goodness, the wisdom, and the power of God, so far as to leave men inexcusable, yet they are not sufficient to give that knowledge of God and His will, which is necessary for salvation. So, in verses 7 through 11, David gives a beautiful description of God's law and its effect on those who meditate on it. He did not have the New Testament yet. So in these verses, David is talking about the Old Testament. Now, a lot of times we'll hear of the word the Torah. And a lot of times that word is used to mean the whole Old Testament. That's the Torah, the Old Testament. But for David, when he would say the Torah, he was just referring to the Mosaic Law, which was the first five books of the Old Testament. This is also known as the Pentateuch. I know, big words. But this is what he's talking about when he's talking about God's law and his precepts. And what he does, a beautiful play on words, out of those first five books, he takes a word to describe God's law from each one of those and he incorporates it into this text. So we're going to look at that right here. So verse 7, he says, the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. So there we go. There's one descriptor, law, God's law. What does he say about it? It's perfect. It restores the soul. It is without error. It's infallible. And of course, it has the power of salvation unto men, according to Romans 1.16. It's God's word. It pierces the heart of man. He goes on in verse 7 to say, The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. There's the second word, testimony. He says that it's sure and it makes wise the simple. God's word 
testifies of God and the things of God. It reveals His glory and His attributes. And of course, those who study it will be made wise. God delights in making wise those who are considered simple or, you know, dumb. God loves to use dummies because then He gets the glory, not them. Verse 8, the precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Precepts is another word. And he says they're right and they rejoice the heart. Of course, they're right. It's God's law. And when we follow this, it brings great joy in our lives to do what the Father commands us. Again in verse 8, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. God's word brings wisdom and knowledge with it. It opens our eyes to see the things of the Lord clearly once again. And then in verse 9, the judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. There is perfect justice and righteousness in God's Word. So he wraps up this section of describing the law, describing God's Word, with verses 10 and 11. And he says this, They are more, talking about God's law and precepts, They are more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold, sweeter than the honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. And moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there's great reward. So, David acknowledges that God's Word is very, very valuable, more so than even the finest of gold. It's sweet, like the, the drippings of a honeycomb. And by it, not only are we warned, but there is great reward in keeping it. So God's Word brings life to us. When we meditate on it when we follow it it warns us it it brings life there's great reward in it so god's word is good we should study it and follow it right can we all agree on that great let's go home <laughs> i wish it were that easy just say okay god's word's good we should study that we should meditate on that it should be what we think about all the time but we know we can't stop there right that's not all that we have to say about it because unfortunately we don't do this many times we don't do this we neglect god's word so what i want to look at now in in verses 12 through 14 is through god's twofold revelation through creation and through god's word this usually produces an effect in people when god shows himself and reveals himself to us we react humans react in one of two ways so we're going to look at that. The first is to react like David did, which is through faith and belief. That's the correct way to respond, just like David did in verses 12 through 13. He, he showed self-reflection, he showed humble repentance, and then he showed a petition to God to protect him from sin. He says, who can discern his errors? Acquit me of hidden faults, which means forgive me of those sins that I don't even know I'm doing. They're hidden sins. I'm not even aware that I'm sinning, but I know I am because I'm a sinner. So forgive me for that, God. And then he goes on to say, also keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. So presumptuous sins means those sins that you walk into knowing exactly what you're doing and you don't care. You're going to do that thing no matter what. You don't care if you get in trouble. You don't care what God's word says. I'm jumping headfirst into this sin because I like my sin. David is saying, look, forgive me for those little ones and protect me. Keep me from doing that. He's saying, let them not rule over me. And then, then I will be blameless and I'll be innocent of great transgression. And he says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. When God's word reveals his perfection, it also shows us our sin. It exposes us as sinners that don't, don't live up to God's perfect standard. When this happens, our response should be, like David, to confess and repent that sin and place our faith in Christ and what He did on that cross and not our own righteousness. The Gospel Transformation Bible says this, How is it possible to be blameless, innocent, and acceptable, as David said in verses 13 through 14. Only through Christ. 
He Himself is the Word through whom the world was created in the beginning, according to John 1. He has ultimately become the Redeemer in verse 14, whose righteous record is now the rock in verse 14 that believers base their life on. This is in Matthew 7. It says this, build your house upon the the rock, not the sand, right? This is our rock. This is our salvation, what Christ did. God's Word exposes us as sinners, as filthy sinners. And we have no righteousness of our own. So we have to flee to Christ for forgiveness and righteousness. God's law, God's Word, God's law was never, the Old Testament was never meant to be our salvation. It was meant to reveal our need for salvation by showing us our sin and exposing it. To reveal our need for a Savior. And that should send us fleeing to the arms of Christ for salvation because only He can perfectly fulfill God's law. Amen? So, Romans 5, 20-21 says, The law came in so that the transgression would increase. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that... As sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. When we consider God's law and we realize we don't add up, that we can't live up to that standard, we turn to Christ for our righteousness. We place our faith in Him and what He did on that cross. Do not harden your hearts to this. When God's holy word exposes your sin and you are faced with that reality, do not harden your heart in that. Push into that process by turning to Christ like David did here. Ask God to forgive you and prevent that in your life. Repent of that sin. Repentance means to turn from something. So the idea is, as Christians, we don't just do sin and then say, oh, sorry, God, forgive me, and then keep doing it. We repent, meaning, God, I have sinned. You are holy and I am not, and I do not want to do that. I want to turn from that. Crucify that in me. Now, this is the response we should have to God's twofold revelation is a love for God, a love for His Word, a desire to want to lean into this process of sanctification when we're convicted, but we don't. We know that that's not always the case, right? I wish it were. Sometimes, when faced with these these realities, we respond with unbelief. Despite all the good things that God's Word and that David said, people still ignore it and forsake it. It's like a child that won't heed their parents' warning not to touch that hot stove, not to run out into the street. As parents, you guys know we do these things because we love our children and we want what's best for them, right? We're not trying to be hard on them. We want what's best for them. But they just won't listen. They think they know better than us, right? This is, what, this is what God is doing. He's giving us life and life more abundantly if we will just follow Him. So many people respond with unbelief to this. Hebrews 4.12 says that the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it pierces as far as the division of the soul and the spirit of joints and marrow It is able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And there is no creature, no creature hidden from its sight. All things are open and laid bare to the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. That's a scary thought. And I love the way it's worded there. It says, look, God knows it all. God is all-powerful. He's all-knowing. There's nothing you do that's hidden from God's sight. It's laid bare before the one whom you have to give account to and whom you have to deal with. That is a scary thought. God's Word exposes who we really are. It reveals our need to prune away that sin. Many times, we don't want to go through that. It's too painful, right? Like I, Maybe I, I dip a toe in and I, and I hear a little bit of this. I read a little bit of God's Word and I hear God telling me about my sin and I'm like, That doesn't feel good. That makes me uncomfortable. So rather than leaning into that process, we run from it, right? We turn from it. Like, okay, got a little uncomfortable with that. I don't want to have to think those thoughts. I don't want to think that about myself. 
Romans 1.25 says that we exchange the truth of God's Word for a lie. And a lot of times that lie looks like this. Well, I'm not that bad. I'm not as bad as him. Or I'm really a good person deep down inside. I've got a good heart. Oh, he's got a good heart, doesn't he? When we say those things, I know we don't, we don't mean anything by it, but think about that when you say that. Where did that come from? Who told you you had a good heart? What does God's Word say about your heart? Ask that question. Here's what God's Word says about our heart. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart's more deceitful than anything else, and it's desperately sick. Who can understand it? No, you don't have a good heart. You're a sinner, and you need Jesus. That's the only way you're good. That's the only way you're righteous, is through Him. Let's stop letting ourselves off the hook. Let's stop excusing our sin and saying, I'm not that bad. Stop justifying it. Let God's Word be your standard for your holiness. And when it is, and you look at it and you say, well, I'm not holy. You say, amen. And you run to Christ for holiness and righteousness. Not yourself. This is what God's Word does in us and through us as we meditate on it, as we read it. It drives us to Christ all the more. This is why it is so important to keep God's Word before us all the time. We need to meditate on it. We need to, to eat it like bread daily. It needs to be our food. John Owen said that you need to be killing sin or sin will be killing you. And you cannot do that without being in God's Word and confronting the sin in your life. But yet, some people still don't care. Whether they want to admit it or not, some people love their sin. They love it, and they don't want to give it up. John chapter 1, verse 5 says that the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not comprehend it. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says that the natural person, meaning us in our sinful natural state, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for their folly to Him. And He is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned the things of god and god's word don't make sense to those who don't love the lord it doesn't make sense to a sinful world and perhaps the scariest of these verses i want to read to you right now from romans chapter one it's a little lengthy but it's worth the read so please pay attention to these verses because there's great warning from God's Word in this. Romans chapter 1, starting at verse 18, says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. Since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes his eternal power, His divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. So again, creation attests to the fact that there's a God. No one has an excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of God, glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over to the lusts of their hearts, to impurity, so that in their bodies, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and serve the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions, for their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way also, the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another, men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, 
being filled with all unrighteousness and wickedness, greed and evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do them, but they give hearty approval to those who practice them. That is the saddest, worst condition you can ever find yourself in. That you love your sin so much and hate God's word and the things of God so much that he just says, all right, have at it. And what's sad about this verse, this passage, is not only these people that do this, but they give hearty approval to others to do the same. Come do like me. Let's all do this together so we don't have to feel guilty because we're all doing it. So our response to God's twofold revelation of himself, creation and his word, should be that we want righteousness. We want more of God. We have a hunger and a thirst for it. Do not harden your heart and turn from it. I plead with you today, be the kind of people that are thankful for God's word and for our unlimited access to it. Last week, Dustin Meadows gave a, heart-wrenching presentation of these guys over in other countries that are doing everything they can just to get their hands on a Bible in their language. And they sent a video so thankful that we're partnering and helping provide that for them. But many of us have multiple Bibles collecting dust on our shelves. And these guys are risking life and limb just to have one copy that they can share with multiple other people. Don't harden your hearts against the Lord. Lean into that and pursue Him. Hunger and thirst for His Word and His righteousness. Take that burden of your sin and that guilt off and give that to Christ to carry for you. That's why He went to the cross, so that you don't have to bear that sin anymore. And it's only through Him that you can be rid of it. So look around you. That passage I just read in Romans 1 is being lived out in our life right now as we speak. Everywhere you look right now, we are in the middle of Pride Month, and it's everywhere you look. It's being thrown in your face everywhere you look. Our culture openly celebrates what God's Word explicitly calls sin. And people just jump on the bandwagon. I don't want to chase too much of a rabbit here, but We know that we love people. We extend the love of Christ to people. Those of you who are parents know that if your child is sick, if they have some disease, you hate that disease because it threatens your child. You hate that disease, but you love your child, so you're willing to do whatever it takes to help your child be rid of that disease. That's our approach to a sinful world. We hate sin. We hate what it's done to our world, but we love people. And we want to help them. So what we do is we call it what it is. And we help them see their need for a Savior. We don't sugarcoat it and say, well, you're good. You don't need any help. It's not what we do. We call it out. We pursue righteousness. We deal with this sin in our life. How can we keep from being a people like this who reject the things of God and look to our own wisdom for our righteousness? How can we do that? Well, for unbelievers, if there's anyone in this place today that has never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, if He is not your Lord and Savior, if you've never given your life to Him, then the call is pretty simple. Start by echoing David's prayer in these verses, in these last few verses of this text. So beautiful what he says to the Lord. Start by confessing your sins, small and large, Repent and turn from that sin and trust Christ and His righteousness for salvation. Pray and ask God to keep you from sin, to protect you from it. Turn from the world and its ways and run headfirst to a God who is holy and just and pure and place your salvation in Him and not in yourself. 
That's the call for you today if you're not a believer. If you've never placed your faith in Christ, you have to start there. Confess your sins and admit your need for a Savior and give your life to Him because He gave His life for you. If you want to know more about that, if you have questions about that, please come talk to me. I'd be happy to talk to you about that. So what's the call here for believers? What do professing Christians need to do in this situation? Well, professing Christians also need to live a life of repentance. A life marked by continual begging God for forgiveness. Because we sin daily, right? I know I do. We strive to do what David said in verse 14. We strive to let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in His sight. We should make our thoughts and the meditation of our heart, the things we dwell on, pleasing to God. How do we do that? How do do I make my thoughts and my words and and the meditation of my heart acceptable to God? I don't know how. Do y'all know how? I mean, thankfully, God has told us how to do this way back in that Old Testament that David was talking about and those laws and those precepts and the the Pentateuch, the oldest of the old stuff in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, he says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God and He is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and daughters, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hands, and they shall be as frontlets on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. In other words, the Lord is our God. Love Him with all your heart, soul, and strength. And never forget that. Write it on your doorposts. Write it on the back of your hands. Put it between your eyes where you see it when you look in the mirror. Teach it to your children. Talk about these things. When you lay down at bed for bed at night, when you get up in the morning, when you're sitting and having a meal together, talk about the Lord. Dwell on His Word. We should be constantly constantly thinking of God and in His Word. This isn't just a part of our life as believers. He's not just a thing we come do on Sunday mornings. He is everything to us. Every part of our life is saturated with the Gospel. Day and night, there's not a moment that goes by that we shouldn't be thinking and reflecting on the things of God. Teach your children these things. Side note, chase a rabbit for a second. Parents, it is your job to teach these things to your children. Do not delegate this awesome, awesome privilege to your church. That is not what Kyle and I or Mandy or any of their teachers are here to do. We get them for one hour a week. Teach them in your home. They are your most precious treasure. You think it's absolutely, absolutely worthwhile to send them to school to learn math and reading and stuff, right? So why would we not entrust to them the the message of salvation? Teach your kids this stuff. Have Have a daily time of family worship where you read and you pray and you sing a song together. There's a great little book called Family Worship written by Donald Whitney. It's five chapters long. I read it in one day. And that's saying something. Pick that book up. Learn a little bit about how to do this. Teach your kids a catechism. I know that's a weird word. If you don't know what I'm talking about, come see me. I'll be happy to tell you about it. Catechize your children. Indoctrinate them with the things of God. Because let me tell you something. Your kids are being indoctrinated whether you want them to or not. The world is not withholding its message from your children. It's being beat into their heads day and night. So if you're not teaching them the things of God, they're not going to know it. Love the Lord every minute of every day. Dwell on these things. Meditate on these things. God has revealed Himself to us in the beauty of His Word and through creation. We should constantly be reflecting on this. It should evoke a love and a thirst for righteousness and for the things of God. 
So my challenge to you today as the worship team comes up, they're going to play. My challenge to you today is this. When we are confronted with God's Word and it openly exposes our sin, I know that's not fun. I know that's uncomfortable. But don't run from that feeling. Don't run from that. Lean into that. Pursue the Lord with all your heart, soul, and strength. Pursue righteousness. Let Him sanctify you. Again, if you've never trusted Christ, you never placed your faith in Him, start there today. Confess your sins, repent, and place your faith in Christ for your righteousness. But believers, let us be a people marked by a love and a passion for God's Word. Amen? Let us be a people that value this above all else. Make time for this above and beyond Facebook and social media and reading other books or whatever. Make this a priority in your homes. 